Our theme for this Christmas season is the call of Christmas. We're looking at four angelic visits, the four times in the New Testament when an angel actually announced the birth of Christ. Last week we looked at Zechariah. Gabriel appeared to him and announced that his son John would be the forerunner of the Messiah. And then next week we'll talk about Joseph and the following week the shepherds, each of whom had an angelic visit. But today we turn our attention to Mary. And you know because we're evangelical Christians, because we're not Catholic, I think sometimes we overreact against Mary. You know what I mean? We don't want anybody to think that we would ever pray to Mary. We don't any want anyone to ever think that we would um, in any way think of Mary as a God. And so we kind of diminish her role in this. But her role is so significant. And so today we're going to learn about that, learn what the Bible says, and some insights into what we can learn from the experience of Mary. Now let me remind you that Luke, we're studying from Luke chapter 1 today, Luke is writing a note to a friend named Theophilus. And when Luke writes this letter, if you will, he says to Theophilus, there are some things that you need to know the certainty of. Some things you need to be very certain about. And one of the things that Theophilus, we think he's a new believer, one of the things that Theophilus needs to be absolutely certain about is the birth of Jesus Christ. So what I'd like to do today is read the passage, and then we'll go back and look in a little bit more detail at the verses depicted therein. So in Luke chapter 1, I'll begin reading in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be since I have not been intimate with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Let's pray. Lord, as we approach this Christmas season, it is right and good that we should study the life of Mary, the one of women all over the world that you chose to be the mother of our Savior. We thank you for her faith And we thank you for her surrender. And we thank you for the example that she set all her life. Bless us as we study and learn from her life today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's go back to verse 26 and learn a few things about Mary. First of all, the Bible says in the 26th verse that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel came to see her. Well, the sixth month of what? It's the sixth month of the pregnancy of Elizabeth. Because in Luke chapter 1, the story unfolds with John and Elizabeth preparing to have this child. And John uh, 
I'm sorry, Zechariah and Elizabeth preparing to have a son whose name is John. And John would be the forerunner of the Messiah. So it is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Gabriel shows up. Now this is a spot where you might want to talk back to the pastor. So I'm going to ask you some questions. The first time that Gabriel shows up, he's delivering an announcement. Uh, we studied it last week. He's delivering an announcement to a man named Zechariah. And the announcement is about the birth of the Savior. This time in Luke chapter 1, the same man, same angel, Gabriel, appears to Mary. But there's one other place in Scripture where Gabriel shows up. Now, while you're looking for that, if you don't know already, you feel free to search your, search your devices using that cool new password, John 3.16. While you're looking for that, let me tell you that there are two archangels named in Scripture. One of them is Gabriel, and the other one is who? Michael, exactly. Now, there may be other archangels, but there are those two that are named. And there's only three places in Scripture where Gabriel is named and one of them is in Luke chapter 1 when he appears to Zechariah. The second is in Luke chapter 1 when he appears to Mary. But the third is in the Old Testament. Can anybody tell me the third place that Gabriel shows up in Scripture? Daniel. You got it. Some of you remembered that. And in the book of Daniel, giving these incredible prophetic visions from the Lord. And Gabriel shows up with the task of helping him to understand the prophecy that he is seeing. So Gabriel is a messenger from the Lord, and he is sent to Mary to deliver the word of the Lord. Now Mary lives in, verse 26, in a town called Nazareth, about 15,000 people. The thing we need to remember about Nazareth is it is considered a not very Jewish city. The kitchens there were not as kosher as they would be in Jerusalem. Why? Because it's on a caravan route, and lots of people pass through the little town of Nazareth. And so a good Jewish leader of that day would think, you know, if God has something to say to us, he surely will that deliver that message to someone in Jerusalem, not someone in Nazareth. In verse 27, the Bible says that Mary was a virgin. That is, that she has never been with a man. Now, this doctrine is one of the two most attacked doctrines in all of Scripture. The virgin birth and the resurrection are constantly attacked by the critics of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some would tell you that the word translated virgin literally means young girl. Well, kind of true, partially true. It does mean a young girl. It means a young girl of the age that she is about to marry, but it also definitely, without question, no hesitation in saying it means a young girl who is of marriageable age and who has not been intimate with a man. She is probably around 16 years of age, maybe a little younger, maybe a little older. We won't miss it much if we think of her as a 16-year-old. And she is a teenager who is preparing for her wedding. The Bible says that she is engaged. Some translations say that she is pledged to a man named Joseph. Now that's not the same thing as engagement in our day and in our culture today. It was a formal agreement. She had agreed and pledged to marry a man named Joseph. Now the wedding was probably some six months to maybe as much as a year away. But during this time of the engagement, during this time when the pledge was in place, it would have required a divorce for Mary and Joseph to not marry. It was that formal of an agreement. And of course, Mary still lived with her parents, with her family. And there would be at the end of that engagement period, a week-long wedding feast. And then at the conclusion of that week-long wedding feast, Mary and Joseph would begin to live together as husband and wife. So the angel appears to a virgin and her name is Mary. And she lives in the small town of Nazareth and she is engaged to a man named Joseph. In verse 28, Gabriel shows up and Gabriel gives her a greeting. In that 28th verse, the angel said, Rejoice, favored woman. Now I would like to ask you to turn your attention to those words. Rejoice, favored woman. Because the word that is translated rejoice and the word that is translated favored 
are very similar words. Now, it is true that the word charis was used as a common greeting. You'll remember many times in the, in the writings of Paul, he begins his letters by saying grace and peace to you. One of the reasons he does that is because it was not unusual in the Jewish community to walk up to someone you hadn't seen in a while or someone you'd seen every day. And instead of saying, hi, how are you? You'd say grace. Charis was a greeting. And so it's not an inaccurate translation for the angel to say rejoice or for the angel to say greetings. Or in the old King James, we remember it as hail. Remember that word? H-A-I-L. Hail. But the word that the angel actually said was the word charis, which means what? Grace. It means grace. One Bible scholar I read this week said, a very literal interpretation of what Gabriel said to Mary could be rendered this way. It could be understood that he said, grace to you, you upon whom God is pouring out his grace. Because the word favored is also a form of that same word, grace. So grace to you, you are a recipient of God's grace. And then the angel said, the Lord is with you. Now notice that in verse 29, Mary was very troubled by this greeting. She's not troubled by the appearance of an angel. She's troubled by the greeting. Now, she might have been troubled by the appearance of the angel, but we're not told that. What we're told in verse 29 is she's troubled by the greeting. Now, what is it about the greeting that would be troubling? There's no problem with an angel saying, Grace, you're highly favored. You're a recipient of God's grace. There's nothing troubling to us about the angel saying, The Lord is with you. But I would ask you to remember that Mary knows her Bible. She knows it really well. And if you want to see some evidence of that, look at the song that she sings, speech that she delivers in the later part of Luke chapter 1. It's called the Magnificat, and she expresses her praise to the Lord. Well, that Magnificat is filled with quotes from Scripture. Mary knows her Bible, and she knew that that phrase, the Lord is with you, was used by God when God was about to give someone a task that would require the Lord's presence and power. I'm convinced that that is why Mary was troubled by not just an angelic appearance, she was troubled by the statement, uh, greetings, you're a recipient of God's grace, the Lord is with you. It's only troubling because she knew that God said to Moses, I will be with you just before he sent him to free the Egyptians from slavery. She was troubled by that statement because she remembered that God said to Joshua, the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go just before he sent him in to lead the people into the promised land. She knew that God had said to Gideon, the Lord will be with you just before he took on the task of freeing the Midianites, uh, freeing the Israelites from Midianite uh, uh, oppression. You see, that's why Mary said, this is a troubling statement. What, what is God about to ask me to do? And that's also why in verse 30, the angel says, don't be afraid. And guess what? He used that word grace again. In verse 30, he said, don't be afraid because you have found favor with God. It means grace. Don't be afraid that God's going to send you to, uh, to do some great task. Don't be afraid that you have chosen uh, to fulfill a role that is so significant that you will need the presence of the Lord with you. Don't be afraid because you're also the recipient of God's grace. So the angel Gabriel is about to tell Mary something astonishing, something amazing, something that will uh, absolutely be beyond her capability to understand. And yet the angel is reassuring her by saying, the Lord will be with you and by saying, you are a recipient of the abundant grace of God. And then the angel says in verse 31, now listen. I think this is the point at which Gabriel is delivering his formal message. 
This is the point at which Gabriel is saying, now this is what the Lord has sent me to you. And so he begins by saying, you will conceive, you'll give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. Now the angel is going to say four things about Jesus. Uh, you might interpret it as five things, but I've combined a couple of them, and I'll show you why in just a moment. But the angel is saying at least four things, and the first thing the angel is saying to Mary is that the child who will be born is to be named Jesus. If you're using your listening guide, that's the first uh, fill-in you have. His name is Jesus. Now, in the Hebrew, that would be the word Joshua. So the, Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew Joshua. And it means Jehovah is salvation. Or it could be translated Jehovah saves. Now, it's not at all unusual for a child in that day and time to be named Joshua or in Greek, Jesus. Not at all unusual. Many families would name their child Jesus because they hoped that someday their child would grow up to be the long-awaited, promised Messiah. They wanted that for their child. So they would name their son Joshua. Jehovah brings salvation. But this child is named by Jesus. Named Jesus by God. This child is named by the Lord Himself. So the angel says His name is Jesus. The second thing the angel says is He will be great. Don't miss the impact of that simple statement. Now we might just let that roll off and say, well, yeah, Jesus is great. We get that. Jesus is great. But you know, there are many Christians in our world, or at least they call themselves Christians, who are somehow ashamed of the name of Jesus. Have you ever heard people make, uh, uh, give speeches in a very public forum and they hesitate to use the name Jesus? It's not hard to talk about God. It's not hard to talk about the Heavenly Father. And I hate this one, but a lot of people talk about the man upstairs. It's not hard to lift a finger toward heaven when you make a touchdown, and I'm not objecting to that. But just think, how many times do people in those public forums actually name the name of Jesus? It is ridiculous for any Christian to in any way be ashamed of the name Jesus. I read John Piper about this passage, and Piper said, For a Christian to be ashamed of Jesus is like a candle being ashamed of the sun. It's absurd for us in our lowliness to be ashamed of Jesus. He is the great one. So the Bible says that Jesus will be great. He created the world with the word of His power. And the book of Colossians tells us that He holds all things together. That's a measure of the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it about this world that really excites you? I mean the physical things in this world. Is it nature? Do you love to go see the incredible mountain views and the waterfalls and rivers of Central Oregon? What is it about this world that excites you? Is it science? or math? Are you excited by art or literature? What is it about this world that excites you? Jesus made it. That's how great that He is. If we gathered all the greatest thinkers of the world and put them in a room with Jesus, all the greatest thinkers of the world would listen to the wisdom of Jesus. If we gathered the greatest artists of the world and put them in a room with Jesus, they would ask Him about the beauty of the sunset that they had seen just the week before. If we gathered the smartest surgeons and they sat in a room with Jesus, they would ask Him about the human body and the anatomy of human beings. You see, Jesus is great. And we don't need to let that phrase just roll off our tongues lightly. He really is great. So the angel said, His name will be Jesus and He will be great. And then the angel said, He will be the Son of of the Most High. That is an unrivaled claim. That He would be the Son of the Most High is an absolutely incredible statement. It is a statement that identifies Jesus as the Messiah. And Matthew tells us that about 30 years later, 
this word would be confirmed, and it would be confirmed at the baptism of Jesus. Remember what happened at the baptism of Jesus? John baptized Jesus, and then they heard a voice, and the voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It was confirmed one other time by the voice of God Himself at what's called the transfiguration. When that mountaintop experience, Peter, James, and John went to the mountaintop with Jesus. And there on that mountaintop, the Bible says that Jesus was transformed in their midst before them. He, he be, his, his glory began to shine through. The light of His very presence began to shine through. And He had this conversation with Moses and with Elijah. And in that moment, the Bible says, Peter, James, and John, and all those gathered heard the voice of God. And God said, this is my beloved son. See, this is confirmation of what Gabriel said to Mary. He will be called the son of the Most High. And then the Bible says he will reign forever. In verse 32, it speaks of the throne of his father, David. Now, the the kingdom of David was the high point for the nation of Israel. It was the greatest moment in their history, the time when David was king, even greater than Solomon, even though Solomon had greater riches and Solomon built the temple and Solomon uh, um, uh, had more political influence around the world. It was the time of David that every Jew looked back as the high point in the history of Israel because at that time, God made a promise to the people of Israel. And the promise he made was that the throne of David would be inhabited by a new king, and that that kingdom would be established forever. That kingdom would go on forever. Jesus is that promised king. The Bible tells us about the triumphal entry of Jesus. About a week before he was crucified, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and he's riding that donkey, and the people began to praise him. Remember what they said? They said, Hosanna to the Son of David. Because they recognized that this Jesus was about to assume the throne of David. He was going to become king of kings. And they longed for that day when the throne of David would once again be inhabited by a real king. You see, this is a clear reference to Jesus as the Messiah. Now, they misunderstood what it meant for him to be to inhabit the throne of David, didn't they? They didn't really understand what that meant. They were thinking of overthrowing the Roman authorities. They weren't thinking of forgiving our sins and establishing a spiritual kingdom that would be forever. But listen to some of the prophecies that were made uh, in the time of David. Nathan, the Lord speaks to Nathan, who was prophet during David's time. And the Lord said, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. In Psalm 89, the Bible says, I will build up your throne to all generations. The prophet Isaiah said, there will be no end to the increase of his government and peace. And then in the book of Daniel, and we just learned that Gabriel appeared to Daniel to help him interpret the prophecy. Well, one of the prophecies that the Lord gives Daniel is about this eternal kingdom. Listen to this sentence. It says, to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve Him. His dominion will be an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. The angel said about Jesus that He will establish a kingdom and that He will reign forever. Well, when Mary heard these words in verse 34, she could She said, how can this be? I've never been with a man. I've never been intimate with a man. So how can this possibly be? And in verse 35, we have the only explanation in all Scripture of the virgin birth. And it is a simple explanation. Gabriel approaches the subject reverently. And it is delicately stated. But it's necessary. Because the only way that a virgin can conceive is if God performs a miracle. So Gabriel describes the miracle. And he says that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That word overshadow is interesting. Uh, Remember a few minutes ago we talked about the Mount of Transfiguration. 
So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, and there His glory begins to shine through. Mark tries to describe it as it's been told to him, and he says His his face was glowing with light, and even His clothing became so white, and, and the way Mark puts it, whiter than any laundering process could make it. it it's funny how, how James, uh, Mark tries to put it. And then he says, um, Peter spoke up, and Mark tells us the inside of this because he talked to Peter about it, I think. He says, Peter spoke up because he didn't know what to say, which is a good time to say nothing, by the way. We don't know what to say. And P- Peter spoke up and said, well, we need to build three temples, three tents, three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then the voice speaks, and the voice says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. <laughs> Not a time to talk, Peter. It's a time to listen. Listen to him. But here's what we forget about that story. The Bible tells us not only that the voice spoke on the Mount of Transfiguration, but the Bible says that a cloud descended upon the mountaintop and then the voice spoke. Well, the word that is used to describe that cloud descending from which the voice of God speaks is the word overshadowed that is used to describe what happens in Mary's life. It's the same experience that we see when the tabernacle is built. The tabernacle is built, and when it's finished, God moves in, and what do the people see? They saw a cloud. They called it the glory of God. When the temple was finished, they saw a cloud as God moved in. It was called the glory of God. You see, the the cloud, the overshadowing presence of God, simply told Mary and and Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. It simply told them that God is here. God is manifestly, obviously present here. So that's the the word that, that Gabriel uses to describe the experience of Mary. And then notice in the middle of verse 35, the word I highlighted for you, the word therefore. Because of this experience... Because of what is going to happen when God's presence is just manifestly clear in your life and undeniably, He's undeniably there because of that. Therefore, the one who will be born will be called the Son of God. Now, verse 37. uh, Well, verse 36, uh, he tells her about Elizabeth. If you want to see the proof of what God can do, go see uh, Elizabeth, your relative. She's already six months along and She was childless, so that's a miracle of God. And then in verse 37, the angel gives us one of the greatest Christmas verses in all the Scripture. And I don't know if you've thought of this as a great Christmas verse, but it is. And it says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Now, translating that verse, nothing... Is, is an accurate, good translation. But could I tell you literally what Gabriel said? Gabriel literally said, no word, word, no word from God will be impossible. Now that's significant because in verse 38, Mary says, may it be done to me according to your what? Word. See the connection? Gabriel says, no word from God is impossible. She says, let it be done to me according to your word. You see, that's the thing we need to grab hold of this Christmas. No word from God is impossible. If God says it, God will do it. There there are two words, speaking of words, that ought to always go together in our thinking. Christmas and miracle. Those are important words for us. Christmas and miracle. Because Christmas is based on a miracle from God. I know that some of you are carrying a heavy burden this Christmas season. For some of you, this Christmas will be a lonely time. For others of you, there may be incredible financial difficulties in your life that only a miracle from God can overcome. Some of you might be unemployed or underemployed, and you just don't see any hope for how to overcome that difficult situation. Maybe your marriage seems hopeless, or perhaps your children are drifting farther and farther away from God. These situations are impossible in human terms, but Christmas 
is all about miracles. That's why Mary says, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm the Lord's slave. May it be done to me according to your word. Don't underestimate what Mary is risking here. What she's willing to give up here. Gone are the dreams of a 16-year-old girl and her incredible wedding. Oh, there's going to be some kind of a wedding, but not like it would have been had the angel not visited her. Gone are her plans for the week-long wedding feast. We don't know if that even happened. If it did, it certainly wasn't the same. Her friends and her family would not believe her. There would be misunderstanding and gossip and shame brought to her and to her entire family. And Mary understood the reality here. She was absolutely risking that she would lose Joseph. In fact, Joseph's first reaction is that he's going to divorce her. He's going to do it quietly, but he's going to end this relationship. But Mary believed God when God said all things are possible. When God says something, it is not impossible. So she believed God and she never looked back. The so what of, uh, of today's message, I'd like to ask you this, this question. What does God want of us this Christmas? What do you think God would like to see from us this Christmas? I think what God wants from us is simple faith. It's the same thing He wanted from Mary. What God wanted from Mary was that she would trust Him. Trust Him to keep His Word in ways that she could not comprehend and had no way of understanding. Trust Him to keep His Word in unexpected ways. And that's what God asks of you today. Jesus put it this way. He said, your heart must not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He went on to talk about heaven. And then He said, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to Father except through me. You see, the Christmas miracle is that you can have access to God through the way, the truth, and the life. You can have access to God and His power and His wisdom and His guidance. You can have access to God no matter what problem you're facing today through Jesus because He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. If you need to talk with someone about your relationship with the miracle of Christmas, Jesus Himself, if you need to talk with someone about how your sins can be forgiven or how you can be close to God in your moment of trouble or in your moment of greatest victory, if you need to pray with someone about how you can be close to God, we ask you to come during this closing song or after it, whichever you're more comfortable with, Just come to the prayer wall, or someone will meet you on this side. If you don't want to walk all the way over there, we have some folks on this side as well that can pray with you and pray with you about your relationship with God.